Welcome, my friends. Welcome to my world. I'm your host, Hello, Kevin Rutherford, and we have a special edition today. We are not live. This is a pre recorded show, so don't pick up the phones. Don't call. Just sit back and relax. We've got a lot of great information lined up for you today. Helping me out, a friend of mine and our favorite financial analyst in the trucking industry, Noel Perry, is joining me again. Noel, welcome back. Thank you, Kevin. Nice to be here. Well, it's great to have you here. So uh, are you kind of semi-retired these days? Kind of semi-retired, yeah, but I'm still following the industry. I, well, I figured you were. You're kind of, kind of easing your way into retirement? Yeah, you know, I take the work that comes in, and then otherwise I do what I want to do. Well, Love that. You know, both of them are all what I want to do. So, yeah, it's good. Yeah, that that's uh, that's good stuff. You know, the the traditional retirement that we've watched for decades. You work forty or fifty years at a job most people hate, and then they retire, and within six months their health declines, and it's kind of a horrible system. You know, going from being you know on such a tight schedule all those years, and then all of a sudden nothing. And most people aren't going to be able to afford to live a life of leisure every day. And just, so, you know, I just think that we just kind of rethink that whole retirement thing. And, and the way you're doing it is more of what I envision for myself. Not not ever waking up one day and go, OK, I quit. I'm not working anymore. But, but kind of easing out and then just picking and choosing when and what I want to work on. Yeah, you know, I, I quit corporate life in, in, in 08 because I had enough of doing what somebody else wanted me to do. And since then, I've done what I want to do. And most of that's been work, but a lot of it's been pleasure. And I just do what I want to do. And that includes trying to understand this goofy industry we're part of. <laughs> yeah, and it's been a little challenging here lately. You know, it's it's another thing I help owner-operators with because that's a great business model that with a little bit of planning during your last, you know, five to 10 years, finish up with a nice paid off truck that's still got, you know, still very serviceable and got a lot of miles in it. And then, you know, pull some freight when you want to. And there's a couple ways you can do that. There are a couple carriers that you can lease on, let you do that. You could get your own authority, but what a, and you could combine that with travel, you know, These guys have driven all around the country their whole life, and they haven't seen hardly any of it other than what you can see from the interstate. What a great time to just say, hey, look, I'm going to look for freight to this area, and I'm going to deliver the freight, and then I'm going to take three or four days off and grab a car and go see stuff. And what a great retirement. I knew a guy in Wisconsin who was of retirement age, and uh, he had his own rig, and he took one round trip to Dallas out of – Green Bay a week. The rest of the time you play golf. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. I have a yeah. listener and really a friend, a female who's been in the industry for a while, very, very successful owner operator, still young. She's nowhere near retirement age, but she has worked out dedicated freight. She's leased the Landstar. She's been on a dedicated account for years. She works basically one run every other week. She's got a run of windows. It's a dedicated run, goes to, I think she's got multiple stops with it. It's out kind of like the Montana area out there. And I don't know all the details exactly, but she works every other week and she just loves it. Sounds like a winner to me. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. So speaking of this crazy industry we're in, and I want to get to that. And we talked to you not that long ago and you had some great insight and just seems like things are so volatile these days and and unusual and we thought might not be a bad idea to check in with you again before we get to it though i don't want to put you on the spot but do you mind if i throw out a topic and see if you've had if you have any thoughts on it at all if you haven't it's no big deal but if you do i i really respect your uh, opinion and judgment on a lot of things thank you well go ahead AI, what's happened here in the last uh, month or two with AI. So from my point of view, I was just at a conference in Vegas about uh, six weeks or so ago, 
And I was there and I came across this thing called Chat GPT. They were just releasing it and I didn't know anything about it. And turns out it's an, a, basically an AI, artificial intelligence text bot kind of thing. So you can start a conversation with it and you can ask it questions or you can ask it to write stories. And I was just intrigued by this because I, I've been studying AI for about a decade on and off. Nothing intensive, but I read articles when I see them and try to get my head around it. Yeah, cool. What's that? I, said, I do the same thing. Okay, good. Well, well, then I'm sure you will have an opinion on it then. I wasn't sure. So think, oh, okay, here's AI. We finally get to see what this thing does. And it's pretty incredible. I mean, it writes in a really very unique and original voice, and it, it is unique. It's not copying and pasting stuff. It's taking all the data that it has access to and then writing something original. And it's good. But if you think about it, English, the language, has very clear rules. We have rules around writing effective ad copy. And, and all this thing has been, it's just been taught how to, how to interpret and follow all those rules. And it does a hell of a job at it. It writes really good, clean copy. It's, uh, it's pretty original. It's interesting. So we're playing around with some things. We, um, my business partner, Aaron, uh, I just got off the phone with him. He is running our, like when we record this show, when we're done, we're, we, we're licensing some AI technology that's made for audio and he'll run it through there. It will do the best editing job I have ever seen. It takes out silence that's too long. It will take out what it calls unnecessary words like um and uh that they just disappeared, edits them right out. It brings all the volume up to level, which is really, really difficult to do on audio. So if you have one caller really quiet and one loud, which we get all the time, it evens that out. It takes out white noise and static. It's just incredible. And then it writes a summary of all of the calls and the content in the in the show, and it did hell of a job. Listen to this. I'm just going to read this. Uh, I just did a show today, my live show, and we ran it through the AI. And here's the the recap or the summary. Experts recommend oil change and thorough inspections to identify aluminum source. The expert recommends changing the oil and running it for 25,000 miles to see if the oil levels return to normal, if the aluminum levels return to normal. If not, a secondary test may be needed to identify which part of the truck the aluminum came from. And then it goes on and on and on. None of that is what I said. None of it is copied and pasted. It is all interpreted and rewritten. That's amazing. So there's these really cool uses of it. There's also people being put out of business. Here's an interesting take. Podcast took off around 2005 or so. By 2010, there are multiple companies that have been built and, and all they do is edit and clean up and summarize podcasts for people. And it's pretty expensive because it's labor intensive. We don't do it because we just have too many hours. It would cost us a fortune. The people who do a one hour podcast a week, you know, it's a guest interview. They usually have theirs professionally edited and it's nice and polished, but, but it's expensive. Those companies that that industry hasn't even existed for two decades and it's going to disappear. Yeah. Technology is well, you know, there's this belief somehow. Most um, uh, most obviously demonstrated by uh, some economists and some environmentalists that progress of human technology has stopped. Okay. Well, the, the the data shows that it continues to accelerate. Now I'll I'll make a statement about myself that, that helps to demonstrate the uncertainty around this whole thing. Um, and I'm not using uncertainty as a bad term. I'm using it as a, a descriptor. I was born in 1946. And so what that says is that I'm a product of the first half, the first half of the last century. Right. So even though I'm, I am about as future-focused a person as, as, as can be, 
Uh, it is ludicrous to think that me, coming out of 1946, have, have any understanding of what the world's going to look like by, by 2050. It is It will be so alien, right? Te- technical anyway, to what I'm, I'm used to, that about all I can say is, boy, it's going to be different. Now, right. Having said that, human nature doesn't change. That's a good and point. So those aspects of our business, you know, for instance, you know, looking at what you do for a living, you know, uh, it's almost certain that that the owner operator community or whomever that community morphs into will still be populated by people who need a lot of help, um, who are looking backwards, who uh, aren't aren't thinking logically, et cetera, that need the kind of help that you've given over these years. In the same way that I've made a pretty good living of helping people recognize the obvious. <laughs> and they haven't. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think you probably underplay your skills there a little bit, but I, I do understand what you're saying. So, you know, it, thank you. one of the things that seems to be happening, or maybe it's just me because I'm getting older, I don't know. I was really early into technology, although, you know, we tend to think of it as, as younger people, but I was right there on the edge. Uh, PCs were were available and, and, you know, about the same price you pay for one today when I was in high school. So I got interested in it right then. I didn't really have a computer, ever use one when I was in high school, but about two years out, I was in the military and I actually built one. With parts from Radio Shack. It had a cassette recorder and use a TV monitor and oh, yeah. through a couple other parts you could buy at Radio Shack. And I actually built a little computer and I, I've been on a computer ever since. I was on social media in the late eighties. So there were actually social medias. We had, you know, chat rooms. We called them bulletin boards back then. Not all that different from chat rooms today. There there weren't any graphics. It was all text-based like DOS, but it was the same thing. You could talk with anybody anywhere in the world that was on the internet someplace back in the late 80s. So I've been, you know, pretty up on technology, but all of a sudden, it seems to me like issues in our society, and we can go through a bunch of them. One day, I, I've like barely heard of them, and the next day, they're everywhere. Is that a pattern that's happening, or is it just my imagination? Well, I, I'll, give you, I'll give you two cuffs at it that, that reflect the same process. Have you ever heard of the chondritis cycle? No. Maybe you have, maybe you haven't. But he was a Russian that ended up at Wharton in the 20s, and he basically looked at economic history, and he, he discovered, and I think he's discovered accurately, that uh, <laughs> technical change happens in waves. And uh, uh, when it happens, uh, change accelerates rapidly. And then we get used to the idea and things settle down for another 25 years. And then the technology we're used to at that point gets a little old and things slow down even more. And entrepreneurs come up with, or scientists, whomever, come up with a new set. You know, for instance, look at the late 30s. After the Depression, suddenly we had things called airplanes, and yeah. we had things called um, televisions. We started to build super highways even then, and we and we invented penicillin. Yeah, and um, once the war was over, our parents, your parents, and my parents took those ideas, and and they they founded the biggest prosperity in the history of the world. Yeah. And then it slowed it and it speeds up again. Now that's one cut. And the other cut is that is is the adoption curve. And it has three or four parts. The first part is people start talking about it. And then people start fiddling with it. Still nothing much happens. And then people start putting it in play, uh, you know, actually in the street. And and then the last one is that uh, it's a proven technology, and suddenly it takes over. And I will give you an example that speaks to our business, this business about automating trucking, truck driving. People have been talking now, people have been talking about it for, what, maybe 15 years? Yeah. 12 years, something like yeah. that. Yeah, yep. 
uh, and and uh, we are now in the, at the end of the next stage of this, where people are experimenting with it, and they're getting close to actually putting it in production. Yeah. And so you know, sometime uh, you know, sometime over the next fifteen years, we'll go through that, and by twenty forty or so, whatever the answer is, and then who knows what that answer is, will be obvious. And everybody be doing it, and if you ain't doing it. You're in big trouble. Yeah, good point. You know, it's, or, or, or I'll give you another example. The diesel locomotive was uh, first um, uh, experimented with at Cummins Engine Company, actually, in, in the early 20s. Oh, wow. Wesley Cummins had the idea that uh, he, could, he could build switch engines. And, you know, by the, you know, people were experimenting with them by 1930. And by 1940, they were... Uh, they were beginning to come into significant production, and uh, suddenly, between 1946 and 1956, um, uh, they instantly made the steam locomotive obsolete. Yeah. yeah. And, and my my point is, the progress starts slowly, and then finally, it builds and becomes what's the word? You were in the military. It goes over center. Remember that word? Yeah, that's right. Uh, you know. It, it suddenly makes a lot of sense. And so, you know, we're, uh, I think we are on the cusp of a technical, of an era of technical revolution you know, based on digital tools. You said AI. Um, and uh, uh, I think it's exciting. It's yeah, tremendously I, exciting. And, and, you know, I do too. Most I, people I, think it's yeah. I'm really excited for yeah. a lot of things. I do want to kind of explore some of the other, you know, things I, I'm a little more yeah. leery of with this, but I am excited about it. You know, certainly for us as a business tool, I'm already finding uses for it. I've been, I hate writing. Oh, oh, yeah. I hate, hate, hate writing. I mean, I, I don't even like writing a two sentence email. I don't know what it is, but because of what I do, I need to communicate. I research. I have ideas. I want to help people understand them. Sure. So it's kind of hard to avoid writing. But now all of a sudden I have this tool that it won't do a hundred percent of my writing, but honestly, it'll do about 90% of it. And, and it does it really well. And then I go in and kind of tweak it a little bit. And I've already started using that over the last couple of weeks where today will be the first day when I, we post something every day on Twitter called the call of the day from our show that day, we just pull out an interesting call and then we post it as the call of the day. Today, we ran it through our AI. It cleaned up the audio. It sounds fantastic. And it wrote a really nice <laughs> summary of what's in that call. I'm excited about stuff like that. It'll free up time for me to go do other stuff that I'd rather do and oh, I'm yeah. more effective at. Here's, here's what. Yeah. So both you and I have been following this technology for probably like a decade. It seems like I started reading about it quite a while ago. I had no idea we were close to releasing something. That's what I mean. It kind of just all of a sudden, here it is. And within the six weeks since I heard about the first one, all of a sudden it seems to be everywhere. You know, my wife, you know, Lisa Wells, she does a lot of our uh, newsletter stuff that goes out. Our, our email program that we use to send out bulk emails already has AI built in and it will write your email titles for you. That, so that's already happening. And then I talked to my other business partner and he's working on audio with AI. So all three of us in the background are working with three different AI systems and already finding ways to use it. Well, you know, I mean, a lot of it is simply awareness. You know, you, you, you notice it and it, works and then now you're looking where you didn't look before. and here's a here's a trivial example that that uh, that chinese balloon that, yeah <laughs> that went over uh, over your property a week ago yeah uh, uh we weren't looking <laughs> and suddenly the uh, right <laughs> the military is finding all kinds of stuff up there yeah Most of it fairly benign but you know they weren't looking well you now know i guess yeah, we had that, you know, we have the kind of the atmosphere where we fly planes around. We watch that really closely. We have space where you yeah. know, we kind of keep an eye on satellites and stuff. And then we had this dead zone in between that nothing really flies very well. And we just weren't watching it. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, I mean, that's 
Well, that's, I mean, that's another reason why the technology moves in spurts, because uh, once a good idea gets out there, people suddenly, you know, start working on it. Right. Whereas they, they didn't before. You know, you know, what do we do with this? You know, it's a perfectly good example. And, hey, we saw that in spades um, in the 30s and then in the 50s and early 60s. That's right. In the 30s, in the um, you know, we had the first really good trucks and we had the first uh, national highway system that was paved for the first time. And, and boy, oh, boy, were those entrepreneurs experimenting in the, in the 30s. Yeah. yeah, people like uh, like Don Schneider, like like uh, who was the original Schneider? Not Don, his his dad. Okay. And then in the in in the fifties, uh, people said, "Hey, wait a minute! The interstate highway is 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 cutting my transit time in half. Right. What can I do with?" This? Good point. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Hey, I can I can move oranges from California to New York in four, three and a half days now. <laughs> when it used to take a week, yeah, right, or less, and yeah, so that's I mean that's the way change happens. They, and and you know, with respect to uh, the people that we work with in our industry, the the key is you got to be watching, and you got to have some sense as to when these things become real. Yeah, yeah. good point. And, um, you know, it's partly your job and my job to help people understand when they're becoming real. And 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 when you have to start doing something about it, that's the key. Do so, I have to start doing something about it? Yeah. So let me give one more positive that, that we're using this for. Actually, two we've come up with already. And then I'll get to the what I, you know, hope isn't as bad as what I think, but some of the negatives I've already seen in a short period of time. So one of the positives, we have a an app that we brought out over a decade ago to track fuel mileage in heavy trucks. Surprisingly, there aren't many apps out there to do that. And the couple that were out there were really horrible. They couldn't do partials correctly, which actually was a kind of a programming challenge, really. But we solved it. Ours has been out for quite a while we have over 4 million individual fuel tickets in our system, and we have a little over 100,000 individual trucks in there. And each individual user, you know, controls how much data they put in, but we give them the ability to give us all of the specs on their truck, the year, the make, the model, the engine, the transmission, the differentials, the tire size, Every load they pull, we give them the option to put in their average speed, the weather conditions, wind, anything that would affect fuel economy. We let them track that. And then it tracks their you know fuel mileage on every tank, their 30-day average lifetime. I mean, all the kind of data we would get out of a system like that. And what we haven't built in it yet, and we're, we're looking at it now because now we're looking at, think we're getting to the point where we have enough data that the data itself is going to have some value. So we started oh, playing absolutely. around with how to sort this, how to go in and do searches and queries and find good information. And I was shocked at how much work that is. I mean, three of us can spend all day playing around with search queries, trying to find the right data and making sure it's clean and getting rid of all the outliers. And, and so much so that we have this data sitting there and I'm not really doing anything with it because I just don't have the bandwidth right now. And I got thinking, wouldn't this be a great use for artificial intelligence? Should you be able to go in there and and just pull out really good numbers and data and do all that fixing of numbers for us? Well, that's what the experts say. So we're looking at that as you know, as uh, I work with another guy who's you know, really big on fuel economy. Joel Morrow is working with Volvo and and we're collecting tons and tons of data and and trying to go through this data and make sense of it isn't easy. And I I think AI is going to play a big part in that. Let's move on to the negative. Yeah. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, just just one point to add. Uh, One of of the elements of progress in the situation like you're just describing is that you get the data first, 
and it takes a while for people to figure out how to use it. However, five years from now, uh, somebody, maybe you or, or maybe maybe AI, will have figured out what what the algorithm looks like. Right. And it'll be tripping. Yeah. Yeah. And so, oh, yeah. And I mean, the end game here is is pretty obvious. With all the telemetry on trucks, there will be a a a fuel economy module built into whatever the right thinking system of the truck is. Yep. That I, will instantaneously uh, tell you what's what's happening, and then the the AI part, I guess, comes in. It'll tell you what to do about it. Right. Right. Because yeah. Your your fuel economy is down. Uh, here's the problem. Or, you know, with the fuel at this price, how fast should you be going? Good and point. Whatever the answer. I, no, that, you, you just nailed something that we're already working on. Uh, oh, yeah, I bet. We talk about speed all the time in relation to fuel economy. And, and the formula is pretty simple. You slow down, you get better fuel economy. I mean, it almost never fails. We can tell you what the numbers are going to be. We, we've known that for a long time. But driving... So we know that that can change. Well, what else can change in this? Well, the rate can change. You know, these last couple of years, I was not telling people to drive 55 miles an hour like I was many other years because it didn't make sense anymore. The rate was so good and there was so much freight. You could actually do better by making up. Now, it makes sense to go 85 miles an hour, but to go from 55 to maybe 68 even, you know, That started to make sense. Sure, you lost some fuel economy, but we more than made up because the rates were so strong and it was an overall net gain. Well, that's changed. Rates are down. You know this. This is what you do. So now we're back to, hey, wait a minute, guys. You can't be running 70 miles an hour all day long. You got to think about this. Well, AI would do it on the fly and adjust everything in the truck for you. Exactly. You know, in the good grief, in the late 70s, when we were first starting to study fuel economy as a policy issue and you know, when the government was starting to look at it. I did the math and I traded off, you know, the engineers at Cummins told me what the uh, the speed algorithm was. And so I knew how much more you would consume by, you know, for every five miles a gallon, right? five miles per hour. And then I traded it off against whether or not by going faster, you could get more freight. Yeah, that, that that's exactly what, <laughs> what I found. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. And what I found was, if you can get more freight, you go as fast as you can. Safety. Right. You know, you know while still driving safe. And, yeah. you know, so you get a market like a year ago. My goodness, you should be out there doing as fast as you can. <laughs> it's kind of what we were telling yeah. people. Yeah. They were shocked that I was saying that because for years I was telling them to run 60 or less because it's more profitable to do that. But that changes. And, and, you know, this was a great example of where, you know, we won't really think about this as much in the future. One of the places I kind of identified that my thinking was really wrong about this. And I don't know. So I was in some ways, I think I was thinking of artificial intelligence like computers and software and even handheld calculators. I mean, think about how when the first calculator came out, especially the, you know, Texas Instruments, the really cool ones. And and we thought, wow, here is this little device I can hold in my hand. I can give it the most complex math calculations and it spits out an answer instantly. And isn't it, as long as we ask the right question correctly, isn't it always right no, but it, it, but statistics, you know, from a statistical standpoint, yes. Because it's math and math, there's no opinions in math. It's rules. And as long as the rules are programmed oh. in there, right? Okay, well, I'm not a math. <laughs> math is a basic math I'm really good at. Numbers and that advanced math, not at all. So, Well, well basic math is simply an approximation of, of reality. It's a very crude approximation, but the physicists, and, and the philosophers all tell us that there's an incredible uncertainty in what we think is certain in the world. Oh boy! You know, so if you're oh asking, boy, it, you know, it, it's a, <laughs> and, and well, and now here's my here's what makes that practical. In 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 business, we you know we get lazy and we assume 
Yeah. That some things are absolutely right. And we discovered down the road that they, that they weren't. Okay. And, so, and, and so now I see where so you're going and you. you're saying exactly what I'm about to say. So I actually, I, so let me go back and fix the math thing. Uh, based on our rules of math, two plus two equals four, right? That, that never changes. Now, is that a really accurate description of reality or, I, but we know that that rule doesn't change. So the first time I ever picked up a calculator and you try that a couple times on simple stuff and you go, oh yeah, it always comes up with the right answer. And no matter how many times I would have checked the math, the math itself would have been correct. I think, and maybe it's human nature, what you were just talking about. In some ways, in my mind, artificial intelligence was going to be right. And I, that couldn't be more wrong. To think that way, this is nothing like math calculator. What we've already found, the very first one that came out, chat GPT, if you went in and asked it to write a story about Donald Trump, it would actually answer by say, oh, you wanted it to write a positive story or there was a, a certain wording. And it actually came back with the answer and said that Donald Trump was not worthy of a story like that. And where did that come from? But then if you asked it to write a positive story about Joe Biden, it would. Yeah. So I think think the way we have to think about this artificial intelligence is we're really trying to mimic the human brain. We're trying to get this thing to take a bunch of facts and then have an opinion. But somebody still has to program how all that happens. A human well, being is writing the instructions for this. And what we're seeing is artificial intelligence is just individually programmed human beings almost. Well, you said the, you're starting a, a, this sounds like a philosophy course. Yeah. Uh, because they, you know, I mean, at the end of every, college philosophy course, they end up asking these questions, you know, what is reality? And does it even exist? And uh, um, well, I had a professor in, in, in grad school that taught me a very valuable lesson that I think that speaks to this. Uh, and that is, she believed that there was no such thing as objectivity. And that object truth, objectivity was simply a, a tool of the empowered and and when we have power we define the world in a way that makes us look you know so if 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 you're fox news you define the world in a way that makes donald trump look good if you are cnn you do exactly the opposite and in both cases the commentator saying i'm being objective right Um, and (laughs) you know so what i Whenever I approach a problem, I, I approach it with a lot of skepticism. And, and I mean, you know, what's the difference between a machine and a man? It's 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 the art, isn't it? Right. Or or maybe it is. If you think about the wisdom of our universe, the uh, that 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 says that that survival, you know, over the eons is dependent on your ability to adapt. And that the adaptations are a function of mutation. Right. Things that we think are better. And and the problem with AI, at least as it now looks, is that people don't build. I mean, obviously they build prejudice in it. But even beyond that point, they don't build mutation. That's a, there's a, something I hadn't thought about at all. You know, for instance, one of the, excuse my been going so far afield here, but one of the problems with our response to the COVID virus is our inability to come to grips with the rate at which it mutates. And <laughs> yeah. we, we think that the answer is to get a, a, um, a vaccine that'll, you know, kill it once and for all, but, but that, you know, by the time the vaccine gets out there, the damn thing changes. Well, there's fortunately polio doesn't do that. Right. And depending on who you're listening to or what you're reading, the there's a lot of people who believe the vaccines accelerated the mutations. It's 
quite touched upon. Well, uh, yeah, there's even some, you know, there's some, well, I mean, what, what's happened with penicillin? Yeah, right. You know, the more we use it, the less effective it becomes because it, it uh, forces the, the, in order to survive, the organisms have to mutate. Yep. Or only the mutated ones, you know, and so maybe, and, you know, I would bet that if we looked at the great entrepreneurs in, in our business, we would find that a high proportion of them, at least the guys that broke the ground for new ideas, were pretty oddball. Yeah. Uh, I mean, for one thing, you have to be crazy to take the risk that those people did. That's true. To begin with. Right. Uh, and um, But the other thing is that, uh, well, I mean, who would have thought that Fred Smith's idea to fly envelopes around and in in Lear jets would ever work. <laughs> You're talking about a crazy idea. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, and and look uh, where it went. Yeah. Or, Holy cow. Yeah, or to or to turn that upside down. Who would have thought that UPS would ever find a way to tame the Teamsters? Yeah. But they have. Good point. Un, unthinkable to most people. Yeah. Uh, and, so yeah. So one real quick question, one one more on AI, and then, then okay. we'll move on. Like I said, I, I, there's so many interesting things going on. I love getting your perspective on them because you get me thinking in different ways. Yeah. So your world, financial analysts, there's lots of them. Uh, you, I don't know how I want to say, you probably be able to explain it better than I do. You follow rules, right? I mean, they're not hard and fast rules. There's a lot of different rules you could use to analyze their, you know, history and patterns and things like that. And uh, then each, you know, analyst kind of puts its spin on it. You, oh, I'm going to go back to the chat part of this, this AI right now, these chat bots. You, not only can you ask it to write a story, I could ask it to write a story about you or anybody that there's enough public information it can go grab. But then I can even add a caveat and say, I want you to write this story in the voice of William Faulkner. And it will. And I don't mean the voice, the sound. I mean the voice, the style of writing. Well, you know, I was about to argue with you about writing since I'm a writer and, and unlike you, I love to write. And, and in the short term, what I would love to have is a far better editor. I don't like editing, but I love writing. And, and here is the application part of it that I, I, I combine my idea with your idea. And that is, <laughs> I, I really take great pride in, in, in writing and writing creatively. Yeah. And, in expressing new ideas. And, 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 and I, you know, it, it's unpleasant right. to think that a machine could, could replace me. How, however, taking the essence of a story and adapting it to the needs of six or eight different clientele would be very valuable to me. Yes. Yeah. What if, what if you we know, took, um, what if we took six people like you, six financial analysts, and, and if there are six in trucking, we'll, we'll get them all in trucking, and we take all of your work over the years, doesn't matter how much it is, that doesn't matter, these computers can go through gargantuan amounts of data in no time, and we tell it to come up with the best from all six. What's it going to come up with? I'm just so curious about some of this stuff. Well, it depends. You know, it, again, it, we're, we're back to the the Donald Trump conundrum, it depends on how you define best. Right. Who programmed now, it to what? Who, pro, who Who's telling it what to go look for it? That's what I mean. That's so hard to get my yeah. head around this. Well, yes, it is. Now, <laughs> and I think the answer is we don't know. Well, we know two things. We don't know what the final uh, outcome is going to be, but we do know it's going to be radically different. Yes. And so the only, when, you know, the question that an economist like me has to deal with today is to what extent does it, do I have to change now if I want to stay relevant? Yes. Yeah. So, in, in fact, and, I would you think. Know, I, I don't know what the answer is yet. Yeah. 
You know, and I'm looking at that, you know, could, could this thing replace what I do? And I'm not going to be arrogant enough to think that it couldn't, it certainly could. Um, so I'm, I'm using it now to, to make myself better at what I do rather than fight it or ignore it or try to hope it goes away. Absolutely critical. Yeah. I'm going to use it to, to, to be as good as I can be at what I do. And, and I think I've, I've said this talking with you on the radio before, but I think it's worth emphasizing now. I'm going to apply that idea to automating truck driving. And here is my point. A a good owner operator has a certain set of physical skills and a certain, you know, and, and, uh, <laughs> and a certain amount of, of endurance that allows him to drive a truck safely for long hours. We know that. Right. Uh, but most importantly, and this is something that, that I've, I'm certain that you emphasize all the time, an owner-operator is a entrepreneur. Yes. He is a businesswoman or a businessman, and the good ones are very good business people. Yes, they are. Now, and here's, Mike, here's the challenge of that those people need uh, to uh, opportunity. Uh, rather than having them sit inactive with their hands on the wheel for 12 hours a day, what if they could be expanding and finding other ways to do their business to provide more value to Absolutely. the uh, public rather yeah. than simply hearing? I agree. And, you know, I mean, we just say it's a fabulous opportunity for somebody to say, wait a minute, I'm going to have the cost of a truck. I'm going to double its productivity. I'm going to double its service. What the hell can I do with that? Right. It's right. Be like that. Oh, no, I, I agree. We're, you know, we're thinking about those kind of things all the time. You know, or, you know, put differently, how many truckers were there in, the, in you know, 1936? And um, if, if you would have told them that the, uh, that 30 years later, the truck would be gone you know, twice as fast and, and hold three times as much. They said, well, no what way. happens to all those jobs? Uh, oh, yeah, right. Yeah. I mean, right. We want these, you know, who'd ask, you know, and, you know, now we have what? We have 4.5 million of those things running around the country doing stuff that people couldn't even conceive of in 1936. Good point. Yep. You know, yeah. So, well, adaptation in, in our universe, you either adapt or you die. That's right. Thank you. Interesting stuff. Yeah. All right. That's why I love talking to you, Noel. You always have such an interesting perspective, and then you get me rethinking well, everything. You. So I love that. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, Enjoy talking to you. Yeah, just some just some current events before we get on to some money and what, what you think might sure. be coming in trucking. Yeah, Mostly I because there's... There, oh, go ahead. I have to quit at the 10 of 5. 10 of... What time? I have to quit in um, in 25 minutes. Oh, got it. Okay. I, I We can do this then. Two topics that are in the news and only because they're all happening right there in your part of the world. The air and water quality there on the Ohio-Pennsylvania line and your senators back in the hospital again. Well, I'm, you know, my, my uh, response to the Fetterman issue is to pray for him. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, and oh. the only question is, you know, can he recover? If he recovers, then uh, he can uh, he can attempt to do what he promised the voters he would. If he can't, then we have to find a replacement. Yeah. You know, I. It's almost kind of sad that I don't know how much this was his choice. It's really hard to tell. It. It almost seems like there was there was a lot more going on, and and. Just seemed a little, you know, I do a lot with health and, and people are stressed right now. Yeah. It's really affecting people's health. And I just think this was a bad idea. What was the bad idea? I'm not him running at all. I just think he really should have taken a step back and focused on his health after the stroke. Well, I, I happen to agree with you. I'm not making a political statement. I, yeah, right. I'm not either. Yeah, I but, agree. Yeah, but, you know, here's the guy who, who had this tremendous amp ambition to be a leader and he had a chance to get in the senate and the senate's a big deal it's a very big deal so i don't know if, i don't know if i would have had the good judgment to say take a step back i probably would have rolled the dice too 
Well, and that's, uh, it's, yeah, see what happens. And, 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 and don't make it right. I'm just, you know, we're trying to understand, you know, I mean, you and I have both had very high goals in our career. And, you know, if you were one step away. That's true. Yeah, it's. I'm not, you know, I would have probably. Uh, and you know what? We have, we have plenty of careers that uh, I'll be working one. Anybody who thinks they're going to get into trucking because it's a healthy lifestyle uh, takes years off people's lives. Well, oh, hard work, stress does. Yeah. 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 So, uh, train crash there. I mean, I know you're not you're not that far away from it, really. Uh, I I haven't. So we're okay. I'll say two things. It's essential that the Norfolk Southern and the owners of the cars, the shippers, who who uh, may well be most responsible for the accident to the extent that there is responsibility, and and the FRA and the National Safety uh, NHTSA, whatever it is. Uh, this is a big opportunity for learning. And there should be coming out of this, you know, uh, rather, you know, rather than try to figure out who to blame, what we should say is, okay, what did we learn and what, how can we prevent this from happening in the future? So that's one cutting. The other cut at it is that our society, our, our economy depends on the movement of relatively dangerous chemicals. Yeah. And yeah. the safest way to do it is by rail. And we've been doing it very, very safely for a very long time. Well, well, you know, if you look at it statistically, you know, the chance of accidents is tiny. It isn't as tiny as it is in the air, airplane industry, but it's quite small. So, you know, and, and you know, further, um, it would be possible, it is possible to run a, a, a railroad with fewer derailments. Except you have to spend a lot more money to do so. Right. And what we know is the chemical companies, as an example, and we as the customers of the chemical companies, want those chemicals to get to us as cheap as possible. Yes, we do. Yep. You know, and and there and and <laughs> for <laughs> once in a while, now you know that wreck at Megantic six, seven years ago? Yeah. The train that went down the hill and killed all those people. Right. That's an example of gross incompetence. And it should never have happened. You know, that wasn't a chance right. idea. It was an example of gross incompetence. This one probably is one of those things that you say, okay, if you run enough trains a long distance, at some point you're going to have a bad axle, which is apparently what it was. And that, that axle will go bad at a time where it's not near one of those sensors that can tell you that there's a hot axle. And so maybe it's it's just one of those poop happen things. It it uh, could be on, on West. Yeah. My Excuse bigger, me, go ahead. Go ahead. Well on, on unless you think it's important enough, and maybe it is. I mean, you know, the technology exists to put a sensor on every Every axle. Right, right. Yeah. And I now, thought you know, yeah. really my take on this wasn't so much avoidance or accidents happen. We do a lot of stuff. We're really pretty yeah. good at it for the most part. And a lot of it usually just does come down to money. If we want to spend more money, we could be even better and safer, but we like cheap stuff. My take on this one is more of it seems like such an odd reaction from our government. That's the. That was my whole point on this is this seems like it would be really, really bad. Like there's a lot of toxic waste there. We were burning it. It got into a waterway that's right there. And yet uh, no real government response whatsoever. There's there's nobody from anybody important at the government that's shown up there yet at all. President Biden hasn't talked about it yet. And they actually just turned down federal aid. They said they're not going to give them any federal aid. I'm just really perplexed. I'm not well enough in, to informed to, uh, to comment on that. Usually the government overreacts. Exactly. But I, 
They're, I, I, I'm not there. Yeah, I, I don't know. They're, they're just, here's the other know. thing. There are no reporters. I'm getting all of my information from individual independent journalists who are posting their stuff on Twitter. There's nobody reporting on this. Well, if that is true, uh, then what it says is that the news agencies figure that people want to read about something else. Wow. Because remember, reporting is a market. <sighs> you know, I mean, look at me. I'm an Eagles fan. I've spent probably 10 hours the last four days, at, you know, reading about the, the, uh, the stupid bowl. <laughs> and I've, I've, spent, I've spent five minutes reading about the accident in Ohio. Yeah. You know, well, so I, no, I, no I hope that's all it is. Does what they do. I hope that's all it is. You know, I was trying to think of, because based on what I'm hearing, the, the numbers, the, the, the people who understand all the chemicals and what could possibly come out of this, they, some people are saying if we had all the data, if we knew what really happened, and, and it's hard to find it, this may be the worst environmental disaster we had. So I was trying to think back through environmental disasters in my lifetime and how did they handle them. And the big one I can come up with, and unfortunately I was in, I think I was in high school, I was probably chasing girls and drinking beer, was Three Mile Island. That was a big, big yeah. deal. Well, I'm I'm in the, in the wind plume of uh, Three Mile Island right now. I know. Yeah. So we're even talking about the uh, same part I, of the world. Hey, I, I do want to get on and I want to get your financial. One more thing on this. And I know you haven't been following it because you've been all wrapped up with, with football. There was a book written in 1985. And the book was about a train traveling through Ohio and having a derailment with hazardous materials and, and it was virtually identical. People from East Palestine, Ohio, because it was in that area, the book was set right in that same area, were extras in the movie that they made about this book last year. How bizarre is that? Wow. Life is full of coincidence. Yeah. So, so weird. What are the odds? I don't know. So let's... uh, that was all for me. I just enjoy talking to you and getting your opinion. And, sure. and now we, we need to talk about some money. Where are we going in trucking this time? What do you think? Anything changed from the last time we talked to you? Well, I, let me, I'm not quite sure what I said last time. So let me uh, say two things that are important about where we are now, <clears throat> maybe a third. First off, uh, the goods economy that we that generates the business that moves in trucks is still way above normal. It's not growing, but way above normal. And it is inevitable over the next couple of years that that economy is going to come back to normal. Uh, and and I'll, I'll give you an example looking at my wrist right now. I had so damn much extra money back in the COVID when I wasn't able to do anything else that I bought four watches. Because I like watches. I was a navigator in the Air Force, and they were important. And it makes me feel young to have this watch. I'm like, well, there you go. I'll never buy another watch again. Or I won't buy another watch for a long time. Yeah. So, you know, my consumption of watches jumped up, but it's not, but it's come back to normal. And and so, uh, even if the economy is strong, trucking's in for two or three years of flat, flat flat growth. And it's the payback for the fabulous years we had in the late 2020 and 2021 and tw- early 2022. Right. You know, things go up and it came back down. So that's the first thing. So what we say is that there's a downward bias in the outlook. Now, it doesn't mean you can't make money because people make money before it jumped up. It just means you can't make money in the way you did two years ago when you're running 85 miles an hour, as we talked earlier. Yeah. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that the macro economy, the underlying U.S. economy, is and the global economy is just full of all kinds of risk right now. We got that stupid war in in the Ukraine. We got the 
as he and I talked, I think, last time, the um, Federal Reserve is trying to put us in a recession. And I agree with him, by the way, because of inflation. I'll talk about that in a minute. Okay. But there's all, and usually economists don't talk about recession because it's hard to predict and it's risky. But the stuff I read is full of recession talk. And, and that, to me, is a very bad sign. And we haven't had a bad recession, not to include that COVID mess, uh, since uh, 09. It's the longest period we've, we've gone without recession in, in many, 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 many years. Yeah. Uh, you know, 100 years or more. So there's a pretty good chance we're going to slip into something that's a recession the next, uh, in the next 12 months. And when that happens, trucking will come crashing back to normal almost immediately. And so that means that, uh, well, the spot market is back to normal. So what that says is the spot market gets the usual recessional problems, which is maybe another 5% of rates and maybe 5% on volume. Contract market's going to come crashing down because it's still pretty strong. So I am pretty pessimistic about the outlook for late 23 and early 24. Yeah. And one of the reasons I am is that I hate inflation. Right. And and uh, the the federal government and the Federal Reserve Bank grossly over have grossly overstimulated the economy for thirty or forty years, and we are finally beginning to pay some of the price for them. And so, even though oil prices may come down and some of the other things may come down, the the underlying inflation rate will be surprisingly high. So, you know, last year it peaked at about eight percent. Uh, I'm forecasting it to be four or five percent this year when most economists are talking about getting it back down to two or three. Oh, okay. Big difference. Yeah. Well, inflation is a very emotional thing and it and it gets very sticky. So uh, that's a big deal. And 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 that's so from a trucking standpoint, you know, we we take two things away from this. The first one is that it's, this is a time to be very prudent. Um, you know, and Boy, you got to get your head out of how, how wonderful it was 12 <laughs> months ago. Yeah. And you and I well know that most of us are still living in the, in the, in the past. Yes. So that's the, you know, that's the first thing. And the second thing is from a pricing standpoint, owner operators and, um, and the fleet have to factor in inflation in their, in their pricing because their costs will reflect inflation. Yes, absolutely. You know, so, you know, and, so, and one of the things that, that you want to think about in, 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 in your consulting with the, with the owner operators is to help them understand how to deal with inflation because it makes their pricing more complicated. It does, um, you know, and even in just the simple part, as soon as we started seeing inflation kind of climb up and it happened fast. I mean, we were at one or two percent not that long ago. Yes, it did. But by the way, that's the nature of that beat. Yeah. Yeah. When it happened, I immediately said, without even thinking too deep, without getting into somebody's pricing and and a bunch of numbers, my first reaction was start pre-buying. Every all the consumables you buy, start pre-buying them in bulk. I mean, if inflation's going up at eight percent, everything you buy now you're getting eight percent yeah. cheaper. It makes sense. Now, there, here's one way to look at this. One of the dangers that I've emphasized in my working for companies. But take the the typical owner operator, and um, let's just look at 2023. If inflation runs at five percent, then and the economy is flat. Let's just, just take that out of the equation. Inflation runs at five percent. Well, his rates are going to be five percent higher at the end of the year. Right. And he may or she may declare victory before they look to say, "Wait a minute, my costs are five percent higher, or maybe more." Or so you know. So I'm not. I'm not at all better off. Right. Oh yeah, my taxes are up because my, you know, because my rates went up. You know, so it's really important. Well, in your terms, if there ever was a time for people to sweat their costs, this is it. And and that's always <laughs> been our focus. I mean, that that's just my take on business. It's how I approach it. You know, we can improve our bottom line by either raising revenue or decreasing cost. We really should do both. 
when we can, but my focus has primarily been on expenses. I don't spend in about the only real advice I give around revenue, two things, understand rates and lanes. So you know how to price and build relationships, right. you know, provide good value, build relationships. That That's my whole spiel on raising revenue. Then I spend all my time on cost because it's so much more technical. And, but I, I just think there's more opportunity yeah. there too. Uh, let me give you an example of some numbers. I think you're going to be shocked by these. And then I'll let you wrap things up. And I, I know you got to go. So uh, we have owner operators that have been, you know, following us or working with us or coming to our events and taking our courses for years and years. One of them actually, his wife works for us. She does our call screening and a bunch of other stuff in the company. She's been with us a long time. Matt, who is the owner operator, helps us out with a lot of things. He does fuel mileage research for us, maintenance stuff. He works with us pretty close. But Matt has also been for over a decade now. He came to our first CMC over a decade ago, I think. He's been working on his business intensively, like all the things we talk about. And everybody who, you know, consults with businesses, lower your expenses, raise your revenue, build your relationships, all those things. He's been doing it intensively. I want to give you some numbers that I think you're going to be shocked by. Could we make a statement that three or four years ago, before everything got really wonky with, with driver's pay and all that, $60,000 a year was probably a pretty strong number for a company driver to earn, right? For an experienced trunk, yeah, a, a experienced driver who, who has a good relationship with the, uh, with the dispatcher. Yeah. yeah. So 60,000, that'd be a good number, strong, you know, right. certainly people at Walmart were beating it and some private fleets, but it's a good solid number for somebody moving general freight over the road. Matt is a single truck owner operator with a, a single driver. He doesn't have a team, it's just him. He drives the truck, he books all his own freight, makes all his own, you know, he does the whole thing. He He's really ambitious and there was a lot of freight out there and it paid really well. So he actually drove over 150,000 miles in 2022. That's a hell of a year. But it is. here are the numbers. He grossed right around a half a million dollars and he took home a little over 300,000. Wow. Isn't that incredible? Well, I, I, my, my reaction to that, I, I haven't heard numbers that good. I've heard some pretty spectacular numbers, but nothing like that. My reaction to that is that, uh, in the first place, this guy's good. And he's obviously operating with special freight of one type or another. However, he'll never get that again. <laughs> well, yeah. Well, thanks for the uh, the downer there, Noel. No, I agree with you. That is that's well, like I mean, a once I, in a career. I thing. know what this. Right. Yeah, I know what this. What the spot rate statistics are, and they went crazy last year, but they're back to normal. Right. Right. Yeah, I just, it's not, they're a little above normal. Yeah, uh, Matt's, know, been, and, and, um, Matt's yeah. been doing this for years. Every year got better, and he was just really well positioned last year. He has all his own, most of his freight's all direct. It just all came together for him to create just really incredible numbers. Yeah, well, I mean, let me put it this way. This guy's obviously one of the best. And by the way, one of the things that I, I discovered 40 years ago is that the best owner operators make the same money with the best fleets? There you go. Uh, you know, uh, well, from a profitability standpoint. Yeah. But uh, here's my skepticism about his ability to sustain that, and that is, you don't need to make five hundred thousand dollars a year per truck to stay in this business. No, and, no, not at all. And and you know, competition will, you know, as the market is softened, competition will. And we'll bring that back. He still will be making twenty five percent more than the other guy. Exactly right. He, right. Yeah. Hey, my best year since I left the uh, corporate economics uh, was four times more what than what I made last year. Wow! Wow! That's pretty incredible. Yeah. Yeah. I. You know. I. I. Um, I hit it on the 
I was lucky and I hit it right on the button one year and uh, made a whole bunch of money. There you go. But I still have, you know, and, and, you know, what I did not do was to design my business around making that kind of money every year. Right. Right. That's a good point. That is. All right. So I'm going to give you hey, the, I gotta quit. Yep, the final word here. I know you got to run. Uh, convey whatever you want to convey to us and we'll let you loose. All right. So I would be worried about inflation. I would be prudent in my investments right now. Uh, I would not be buying a truck right now. I'd wait a year uh, and I would be operating as absolutely as safe as I could. No, Noel, I love that. And I want to tell people that you and I, like all of my guests, I don't coordinate this. We don't, you and I did not talk before we got today. And, you know, we, we called you, said, Hey, we need to do a recording. Can you jump in with us? You did. We don't pre-plan this. We don't talk about it. We don't coordinate answers. You just basically told them what I've been saying for quite some time now. Be really prudent, pay down debt, save cash. Don't make any big investments. Sit back and wait. You know, and if, if my forecast is right and we talk a year from now and the economy is really in the tank, I will be saying the opposite. There now, you go. Well, I'll still say run safe, but I'll be saying now's the time to to take your risks because when the just before the economy comes back is when you want to be ready to go. I, I love this, Noel. You make me sound smart because I've been saying that. Now you're verifying it. Basically, <laughs> we're, so the other way around. What we're really trying to do is, is we're trying to identify the bottom, right? We're kind of watching and looking for those signs that the bottom's there, and we know that we'll start to climb out of it, and that is the time to get in, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, the, what, I'm a cyclical economist. That's what I do. I study cycles, and what that has taught me is your strategy should be almost exactly opposite from where the market is where you are right now. Perfect. So right. you should you should not have been betting the farm a year ago. You know, well, you, your friends who made all that money last year, you should not have been betting the farm at that point. He's been, he's been putting that money away, and you know, in in 2024, when he's making half of that or less, is the time that he should be taking his risks. Let, let me jump in there real quick because I people, love what you just said okay. there, and I. I want to kind of add to it. So when we had him on last time, we talked about this, we actually went the next step and Matt gave us some really interesting numbers. He told us first what happened in his trucking business. Then he told us what happened to his own personal net worth. And it went up significantly. It was the biggest jump in his net worth in 10 years oh, that he's yeah. been tracking it. And that tells us not only was he really good at the business, he was responsible with his money. Well, I mean, that's, well, that's why he makes so much money. He's a smart guy. Yeah. 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 It's, it's, well, I mean, it's magic in the sense that you get the combination of, of, of brains and hard work, but, but the, um, I have, I have two uh, favorite business statements. One of them I quote from uh, Voltaire and that is common sense is not very common. <laughs> and the other one is being smart, you know, good strategy is recognizing the obvious and doing something about it. There you go. And uh, this guy did it. Yeah. Yeah, he really did. Uh, I got to go. Okay. Thank you so much. We'll get you back again soon. My pleasure. All right. Take care. Take care. Bye -bye. All right, everybody. We're going to wrap this up. Thanks to Noel Perry. As always, great stuff. Throughout this year, we're probably going to get Noel back, maybe for some quick hits here and there, 10 or 15 minutes at a time, just so that we can stay on top of this issue. All right, I'm going to wrap it up. We'll see you next time. Be safe, be profitable, be fit and healthy. Always do the hard work and master the journey.